Welcome to the Flex Advanced Manufacturing and Practice webinar series. This four part webinar series will include members of the Flex Manufacturing team, partners, and industry experts as they discuss how to solve industry relevant manufacturing challenges, enhance competitiveness, and enable new solutions. The third webinar in the series will focus on how advanced manufacturing can increase competitiveness. We will now turn it over to the host of the webinar, Eduardo Toledo from Flex. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us again today. Um, we're, uh, I'm Eduardo Toledo. I'm based in California, in San Jose, California. I have been with Flex for over 22 years in multiple roles. Uh, today, um, I have the, the honor to lead the Global Quality and Business Excellence Organization in the company and working with all of our sites in over 30 countries. Um, for today's uh, session, we actually have the honor to have uh, Zoher Mendrick with us who leads the simulation technology for the company. Um, so Zoher, uh, welcome and please tell us a little bit more about yourself. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks a lot for having me here today. So hi everyone, my name is Zohair Mekri. Uh, I am part of Flex and I'm responsible for the digital twin organization at Flex, which is a international function that focuses on deploying digital twins across the company. So thank you very much for having me today. All right, well, welcome. Um, so for today's session, we're gonna be uh, covering um, how basically we're using this uh, technology, right? Uh, to leverage uh, automation. Um, at the same time, how we can reduce the, the launch, the transfer, transfer costs by using this digital twin technology. And at the same time, how material management simulation will allow us to have faster response to the demand changes while increasing our flexibility internally and externally. So um, with that, let's, uh, let's get into it, uh, Zohar, so um, all yours. Absolutely, no, thank you so much, Eddie. So what I'll do today is uh, I'll basically outline uh, the challenge that we have in, in the industry that, uh, that is, is very prevalent, but is also um, an important component to how, how advanced manufacturing takes place. So the challenge that we have is that when we design uh, environments, manufacturing environments and, and solutions, Traditionally speaking, there is a great amount of trial and error that needs to be performed for us to be able to get uh, the correct solution or the correct process or the correct environment that is the most productive and efficient with the highest quality. So what we've seen in the last uh, decade or so, and, and, and even and even longer than that in some industries, is that the, the market has seen a, a, sh a, a pressure where the, uh, the, the time to market and the product life cycles need to be shortened. Right. Because of the consumer demand, we have a, a shorter product life cycle for the product itself. And what that does is it transfers um, that, ne that necessity for to, to have a short a product life cycle into the uh, short time for us to be able to have the manufacturing environment for that product as well. So this drives a lot of different uh, uh, behaviors and needs uh, in the market. And what we need to do is as a result of that, we need to have the ability for us to do things right the first time. So trial and error needs to be shortened and in some cases uh, you know, reduced to a point where we can even look at how to eliminate that. So when we combine a manufacturing environment that needs to have a shorter time to market, that needs to have very short trial and error or no trial and error using a variety of different tools, um, we combine that with things like dynamic supply chains, and that, that affects the entire, uh, entire delivery of the product from start to finish. So this multivariable environment becomes very, very complicated because you have parameters and variables that you can control and that, and that you cannot control. And so this presents a very unique problem, and uh, it, it does require a um, certain amount of, of, of technology and, and requires uh, you know, different types of technologies and different types of developments that can address it and that can solve or at least uh, in some way aid in, 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 this type of, uh, uh, in this type of environment. So what our team does in the digital twin organization is we lead several initiatives that have not only helped us with, with these above challenges, but we've actually increased our competitive advantage by doing so. By utilizing these advanced technologies, we've been able to uh, work on how to address these challenges that the market has, that the, that the market today has in terms of product life cycles and, and uh, in manufacturing. But also it, is, it has aided us a lot in being able to increase our, our competitive advantage in the market because of the fact that we're using these advanced technologies. 
Well, that, that's uh, very interesting, right? Um, I, I'm really curious to learn more about it, right? Um, the way the way I see this, uh, when we talk about the evil twin, right, or um, this simulation, um, I can see it as like if we as a three different levels, right? So um, if we start zooming out, I, I can start seeing the production floor itself or the, the equipment that we can uh, simulate or automate. Then I can also see the next level, which could be the production line itself, right? Um, or um, if we take it one more level higher, it could be the whole factory, right? How we can we can use this technology um, to to start simulating, right, or start creating this digital twin uh, for each of these processes. So by using this framework, um, uh, I know as an organization, right, we are focusing on this technology, right, to also uh, understand the product life cycle right, and see how we can bring all of this. Um, the product life cycle into the whole process. Um, um, so, but um, from your point of view, right? So, uh, how can the advanced manufacturing technology um, can actually help us as part of the the automation um, when we create these digital twins? Absolutely, that, that, that's that's a great point. So, if we look at that first level that you were mentioning, um, we have a, a a technology in our team where we focus on automation digitization. Right. So what we do in this area is if if you're looking at the equipment on the line, let's let's take the automation equipment, for example, for, for this uh, for this case, as you can see here, when we look at automation, traditionally speaking, what you have to do is you have to design the components. You have to test the different types of components in this in the automation system, whether that be the robot or the PLC or the sensors or the end of arm tooling, whatever that might be. We have to test that and we have to do like we mentioned, uh, a little bit of trial and error. And sometimes doing that in real, in the real world environment can be tricky. Uh, it can be, it can cost you uh, money, it can cost you time, and it can cost you resources. And in today's environment, that's, that's, a, that's a very big thing. And so figuring out how to reduce that and how to make sure that we do it right uh, from the beginning is, is, a very, uh, is a very huge win for us. So what we've done is we've created a tool where we, what we call digital design for automation. And what you can see here on this, on this slide is that basically what we're doing is we're using advanced simulation technology. So simulation technology is for us is being able to model what will happen in the real world when we do a specific action. So as you can see, if we were to take all the different types of components and if we were to take the robot and the cameras and whatever else that's, that's in that cell and put them together, we can model them, which is, which is very, very, uh, very useful for us. And it is somewhat common, but when the power, the power from this tool actually comes from being able to visualize and optimize it, which means that we can see how it will look like in real life. The software environment will tell you by scale how big your robot is, where it's moving, how fast it's moving, what it's doing in that area. And what we can do is then take all these different actions and then optimize them, make them faster, make them more efficient, uh, make them better for the environment that they're going to be in whatever that might be. And as we optimize them, we can then take whatever is happening in that environment and transfer that and use that to commission the cells to actually program them. And so what you're doing is you're doing all of your trial and error in a software environment versus doing it in the physical world and having to uh, you, you deal with the, the consequences that come with that. So as we, you know, we, we look at this tool and as we, as we move forward on it, what you'll see is that the uh, it, it comes with a number of benefits that are not just technical, but they're also operational. So if we start from a, the, one of the first things that we use a tool for, when we have figured out how this automation environment will look like and how the cell will look like, we can use it for rough orders of magnitude quotes. We can see how much uh, of, of each equipment or each uh, component we might need. We can tell how much it will cost based on the region, uh, based on where that, that factory is or where that product is. We can use it for industrial engineering analysis. So we can use it to balance the line, figure out the bottlenecks, make sure that we are uh, hitting all of our yield targets and making sure our customers are getting the products and, and the quantity at the time that they need with the quality that they're being able to check because of the fact that we can do all of that trial and error in, in the software environment. We can use it for commercial regions such as figuring out the return on investments and, and, and figuring out how that will look like from a financial perspective. But the biggest thing that comes with it is being able to do what if analysis. All of what I mentioned is basically us taking all these different types of scenarios and figuring out what happens if a certain parameter is changed or a certain variable is modified and a certain range of things happen in that environment. We can take all these different types uh, of, of scenarios and different types of results and essentially tailor them to the environment and to the product and to the customer that, that's, that's, uh, that's looking for them for their expectations. 
And this does a lot for us because of the fact that this technology is so easy to use because we've developed it in such a way that our factories across the world can use it. It increases the automation penetration because of the fact that it's easily accessible. And that accessibility makes it so that people are, are more inclined to use it and therefore they're more inclined to, to uh, implement it into their factories across, across the world. And because of the fact that it allows for so much customization, the iteration and the incrementation of building up that software environment to validate your, your automation um, needs uh, creates a, a, very, uh, a very fast and easy uh, environment to be able to have high quality automation systems deployed for, for our customers. Yeah, well, this is very interesting. I, um, I know many times when we're dealing with um, with product, right, with um, demand, or even with new products, right, we we have to start running these what if scenarios, right. So, um, in the past, we we had to do this in a in a more manual way, right. But uh, this tool definitely give us like a capability to do this in a more robust way, uh, and like you were saying, right, taking all the variables, taking all the the inputs. Um, and then being able to understand what really what is the payback, what is the ROI, what is the um, the the overall um, benefit of the of this, right? And whether we're capable of um, running that scenario and if it makes sense to do it or not, right? So, um, but if we take it, uh, if we start like in, um, kind of taking one more step uh, uh, far, right? And then if we look at the whole process, right? How how do you see this now leveraging this digital twin technology now to also uh, in, ensure that we're helping with the product life cycle, right? Ensure that we can um, create a digital twin, right? For the whole environment, for the whole factory. Um, how, how do you do that? How do you um, approach that for high volume? Absolutely. So when we when we talk about digital twins, the first thing that we have to do is, is pretty much understand how we do a digital twin. So if you see what, what happens is when we go into an environment, every environment uh, has three things that, that make up that environment, right? The first thing is space, the second thing is time, and the third thing is matter, which is the things or the stuff that's inside that environment in that space. So if you take this as an example, let's take this, uh, this line that you see here as an example. This has those same three characteristics. It's in a certain space, there are certain things in this space, and those things are changing over time in that space. So what we do is we gather that data. We take that data, we understand how big is the space that we're looking at, what are the different types of things that are in that environment. So there's people, there's material, there's machines, there's processes that are occurring in this space. And all of those things are changing as time goes on. So we take those different types of information. And what we do is we, we collect that information and we, and we create what, what we start to do is we create a model about, about that space. That model then is there after that model has been sort of, sort of uh, uh, preliminarily made, we verify and validate it. So what we do is we go back, we check the information and we see how it looks like. A very simple test is that when you create an environment that already exists in the software world, you should be able to have the software world and the physical world acting exactly the same. Basically, they should mirror one another and they should be looking how they look uh, uh, in the software world and the, in the physical world should match exactly. That is the first part of it. The first part of it is making sure that the software world, the, the digital world, and the physical world um, are, are matching each other. And now that they're representing each other, now that they're mirroring each other, you've actually completed half of the project only. For our team, what we do is we, we take this and we understand that simulation essentially is just modeling the real world environment. And the number of the, the different types of algorithms, different types of formulas and, and mathematical formulas that represent this world um, are essentially helping create that digital twin. So once we've created that digital twin, what we do is we, we go back to the floor. We go back to the line, if that line exists, and we look at different parts of that environment. We look at what parts of that environment we can change or what are the, the different types of variables in that environment. And then we look at the things that we cannot change in that environment that we call constraints. What we do then is we take these variables and these constraints and we figure out how to create algorithms or functions that can figure out how to relate them mathematically. Once we figured out how they're related mathematically, we figure out what we're trying to solve for, what we're trying to uh, have that result be. Of course, this is done a little bit earlier uh, when we start to collect the data, but now what we're trying to do is mathematically create that function. And when we do that, we can then take these different types of algorithms and figure out what are the different types of ways that these possible scenarios would look like. Earlier, I mentioned that these are called what-if scenarios. These are where we can see 
uh, what will happen if a certain action or a certain variable or constraint is affected in a certain way over the course of time. And then we can take the best optimized what if scenario for that specific parameter and go and implement that. Of course, based on the fact that that line exists, if line doesn't exist, it actually gives us a bit more, uh, a little bit different approach where we have to uh, see how we can do that from the beginning um, and see what kind of environment we're trying to create. Now, this is uh, interesting. Actually, it kind of brings me back to my my, cal my days in calculus, right? But uh, um, I mean, these models, actually, you, you mentioned some in interesting things, right? We have variables, right, that are controllable. We also have noise. Uh, we have some that we cannot control. Um, but how, how do you... Um, and do you take all these variables, right? And how do you create a, a model that is, it's dynamic, right? That it can actually help us account for all of this uh, into the whole digital twin um, model itself, right? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. There are things in, in our environment that we have certain amounts of control over, uh, and there are certain amounts of things that we don't have control over, right? And an example of things that we don't have control over is, is for example, supply chain. You know, we can control our supply chain to a certain degree when, when it's in our factories, but we can't control the supply chain across the world. And because there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of dynamic variables and, and a lot of randomness that is taking place, it's very difficult for us to be able to uh, to know what will happen all the time everywhere in the world. But what we've done is we've, we've created systems and we've created processes and technologies that can help us factor in that level of randomness. So if we talk about materials, for example, when you have materials that are in the factory, they obviously have a certain level of, of information about them. But when you don't have them in the factory, they have randomness. They have a certain level of ambiguity. And we have a word for that. In our digital twin organization, the technology that we use, we have a word for randomness, and that's called stochasticity, which is the ability to have uh, randomness in your environment. And that has to be accounted for. So what we've done is we've taken this type of parameters, these types of stochastic parameters or variables that will constantly change. And we've actually taken traditional data engineering and statistics techniques to create models that can use these unknowns um, as inputs. So we can create statistical distributions, we can create different types of machine learning model, models, and we can look at artificial intelligence engines that are created and derived from these different types of data sets and figure out how we can factor in this variability to ensure that we have some level of understanding of what's happening down to a, a certain degree of, 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 of confidence. And so as we start to build a model and as we start to have more information, we can use advanced technologies and traditional techniques to make sure uh, that we're well within uh, uh, the, the confidence level of what's happening in the environment. If you look at a, at a real world example on the bottom there, that's actually a, a pretty interesting example of how supply chain even affects your space. So on the left-hand side there, you see what the space looked like before we did a digital twin model of it. And what we did afterwards, we, we moved around the layout based on how the material was being fed to the line and how it was coming in. That was, uh, in the end, affecting the, the space that was affecting the yield, and it was also affecting the, the efficiency of the overall process. Uh, and so the digital twin here was able to take those different types of variables, some that were controllable and some that were a little bit less known, and introduce stochasticity and factor that in to actually make the process even more efficient than it was in the past. Hmm. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there's a lot of value. And I know you guys have been working on this for many years, right? So this is not something new. And um, there's a lot of work behind um, all of these algorithms and all these uh, um, models that have been created, right? So, um, but can you tell us more about um, how do you, do you use this now to increase pro production, right? To increase productivity? Um, do you have any examples or anything you can share with us on that? Absolutely. We have an example um, where we were able to use this technology um, in one of our in one of our factories um, that has uh, a medical product. Um, and what we did was we were able to model to create a digital twin of the entire process from the resin to the final ship out box. And we modeled the processes, we modeled the entire factory, the, the space, we modeled the, the, the process uh, times and the people and the equipment and everything. And we were able to analyze that entire digital twin in detail and run our algorithms that were used for optimization that were basically using uh, different types of multivariable algorithms to take into account um, how to do a global optimization model. And we were able to see that we were uh, getting some pretty interesting results. As you can see here, right, we were able to get a 15% increase in, in equipment availability, a 21% increase in station utilization. And that was just from modeling the entire environment and running 
in running some optimization algorithms. So it's a pretty impressive result when you start to understand how digital twins can be used uh, for for that uh, for that purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, I mean, for sure, yeah, impressive results, right? And like you mentioned, I think this was an, uh, an example for a medical customer. Um, and what I think is more impressive, I mean, the value also there is that, you know, those are highly regulated industries, right? Medical automotive. Uh, and many times we can, uh, it takes a lot of work, right? To, to go and start uh, changing things, right? Or because we had to go through the whole validation, the protocols, right? Um, as we do things in compliance. But uh, having the, the capabilities of now running these scenarios, running this what if, right? Um, playing with the model, seeing how we can find the optimum way of, of running something or processing a, um, a product. Um, uh, you have some amazing results, right? So 15% increase of equipment uh, availability, it's huge, right? In, in some cases, it could translate to even not having to open another uh, building or not having to uh, add another production line. Uh, and the same for the utilization on the on the on the station itself, right? So um, these are impressive numbers. I think this is great. I mean, this is the value that I, the the technology um, can bring, right, to the industry and also bring to our customers. So very impressive. So thank you. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, I, I think overall we 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 touched some very important points, right? So obviously, digital twin and the technology uh, is an important piece in advanced manufacturing today. Um, it is new; it's a new. Uh, I think it's a value added that we can bring to our customers. Um, I think you mentioned that it's not really uh, standardized in the industry at this point. Um, but it's something that we've been doing for years and, and your, you and your team have the experience, right? Um, running these what-if scenarios, I think it's, it's impressive, right? Um, it brings a lot of value, right? Um, we can do this uh, offline, right? Rather than just having to go to the line and do this um, physically. Uh, it allows us to, to also understand the complexity, right? Allow us to, to model um, variables, right? That in the past we were not able to to, cons to, to consider or, or see the, re the the effect that they will have on the on the line. Um, and again, not having to do these physical changes, right? Uh, it's it's another great value added, I think, right? So, um, so uh, well, thank you for for all the sharing. Um, let's get more into a, an interactive uh, conversation now. I'll ask you a, a few questions. I know there's a few questions coming through as well. Um, so. So first of all, I mean, uh, how long does it take to create a model, right? like a digital twin model? Absolutely. Um, you know, the the answer for that is is um, a very traditional uh, technical answer, which is it depends. Um, you know, the the reality of it is is that digital twins require a lot of different types of inputs and outputs, um, and it really depends on the scope of the project, right? A, a project that is very small, it might be. Uh, you know, the, the scope is just to create maybe a video just to show a quick overview of a process that can take, you know, just a couple of hours. And of course, that has taken a lot of years of experience for us to be able to say that. Uh, but then, you know, projects that are digital twins of entire factories can take much longer than that, right? Sometimes the, the projects uh, will not end. You know, the digital twin will be an ever living model, right? It will keep growing and growing as, as the processes in the real world keep growing. So, um, you know, it really depends on the scope and, and the best thing to do is have a kickoff, right? And to have a, a meeting with us and, and talk with, to us about it. And that way we can figure out what's the time and the effort required and what we're really looking at and how that scope uh, affects how long it will take to create that digital twin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Uh, I'm just thinking uh, from a, a new customer point of view or an existing customer that is being working in a traditional manufacturing, right? Um, what, how is the, the customer acceptance, right? When you come to them and you tell them, okay, we're going to talk about the digital twin, right? We're going to create a digital twin of your product or your, or your process. Uh, how is the acceptance? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's in the beginning. So, you know, the first thing is, is unfortunately speaking, um, th this is still an unknown space, right? It's not something that everyone knows and it's not something that everyone is fully aware of. And so you have to go through the first thing, which is education and awareness. We have to really sit them down and explain to them, you know, what digital twin is and how it works and, and what we're trying to do and, and how it's going to be beneficial. And, um, and, and what are the, the business benefits and the operational benefits? And of course, the technology benefits that comes with this advanced new tools. Um, and so as we work through the education and awareness piece, we start to see people understand a little bit more. And, you know, people have different levels of, of understanding of it. Some may know more, some may know less, uh, but we do see that having that, that level set in the beginning, having that alignment, really walking through this um, in an educational manner really helps us. And so far, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to say that uh, every customer that we've talked to where we've had the opportunity to work with them and, and explain to them and, 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 uh, and, and have this, this level of, of discussion, 
so far, every customer that we've had has wanted to work with us on Digital Twin, which is a very positive response to us. And, and you know, uh, it, it gives us the motivation to keep, keep growing and keep getting better at what we do for our customers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see why, right? I mean, obviously, it brings a lot of value. And um, yeah, it's, it's new, right, as well. And so it can help multiple industry, it can help the customers, it can help us understand really how things will, will work. Um, so but, but when you start working on this technology, right, what's the path? How, where do you start on this? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a good that's a good point. Um, so the first thing we have to do is even understand whether it is the right process, right? Digital Twin is very flexible; it's very adaptable. Um, it can be used across the entire product lifecycle, across the entire uh, uh, value stream of of production. But that doesn't mean that it can do uh, things that are that are are not related to that, right? So sometimes a digital twin, uh, our digital twin organization gets called on because you know there might be. Uh, you know, a, a mechanical failure, or there might be some kind of, uh, um, you know, an issue that's on the line that 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 uh, mm -hmm. is is maybe a, a maintenance um, related question, or maybe it's related to to, to the equipment itself. Um, and so those types of things are a little bit more different that that are out of the scope of Digital Twin for now, um, because of course, you know, as we grow, we look at different types of areas and how to how to continuously uh, uh, explore and expand this technology. But once you verify whether it's the right process, what you do then is you get the correct stakeholders. You get the people that are uh, working on the on the front lines of the product, of the, whether they're the ones that are assembling it, whether they're the ones that are the engineers or operations. Get those stakeholders and those sponsors in that room and make sure that you have a, a, a right team that's built from the beginning. And once you have everyone in there, you define your problem statement. You define the, the solution. You define what you're trying to do, whether it's a new line or an existing line or an existing operation or new, whatever that might be. Um, we, we really have to make sure that we understand what the problem statement is and what we're trying to accomplish and what those results will look like once the project is over. And then we go out, we capture the information, we get the data, we work with all the different partners and stakeholders to make sure that we have the right um, uh, information to get started and build a model. And the thing that we do at, at, across the entire project, the thing that we, we always stress about is understanding the power of the people, because at the end of the day, Everything that we're doing is to make sure that our people and our teams and our companies and our factories across the world are working in a safe and healthy and, and productive and high quality environment. Uh, and that is what creates, uh, you know, uh, those, those high quality products for, for our customers. So we always want to make sure that when we're doing a digital twin product, uh, we, we never forget the power of the people that are involved in that project. Yeah, very, very important point. Yeah. Uh, and also having the right team in place and having the right, um, defining the problem, right? And, and, and the collaboration to get there and, and the data, right? So it's all about the data as well, right? So that I always keep in mind our, our employees, right? Um, keeping them safe and keeping the best environment for them is very important. Well, um, so um, I know, so when we get into these technologies, right? <laughs> What, what are the type of technologies that you will think people should know about? Uh, what, what would you, um, if, if someone comes and asks you, okay, talk, talk to me about the Eagle Twin, right? But what are the technologies behind this? The technologies behind Digital Twin is, is comprised of multiple different components, right? So, you know, there's, there's advanced uh, simulation. Um, there's things like you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, there's a lot of automation, as you saw, our, our team that works on, uh, that, that manages and leads the automation uh, digitization projects that you saw a little bit earlier. Um, so there's a number of different components that, that, are com that Digital Twin is comprised of. And I think one of the, one of the, one of the, the, the great things that we learned was is that uh, it's really a culmination of, of, of working with people, right? So getting to work alongside, you know, team members from your organization, for example, working alongside the automation team and the operations teams and IT and all the different types of, of organizations internally, really a digital twin ends up being, uh, uh, you know, a summation of all these different, very important components um, that are that are used across the company. And so being able to be in this space and and work a lot with with these different organizations and work with some some really great people uh, creates a very good environment and a really good technology. So, um, you know, I would say that that when we put all these different components together, that's really what allows us to deliver that value to the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is the power, right? Yeah, very good. Well, um, I know uh, one last question, right? <laughs> and we we have all been um, we have all navigated in the last few years, right, with respect to COVID, right? We all um, went through this pandemic together, um, and I'm sure this tool 
brought a lot of um, value, right? Because we were doing a lot of um, new product introduction and we also did a lot of product transfers um, and definitely it's a competitive advantage we have in the company, right? But how, how did, your, did your team work in, in the last few years, right? Um, driving uh, digital twin, right? During a pandemic. Absolutely. It was, it was challenging for sure. I mean, I think that's something that will resonate with, with all of our, uh, all of our audiences that uh, a lot of people had a lot of challenges navigating through the space and through the, through this, through this event. Um, but what we learned was, was that, uh, you know, it is, dif it is difficult, right? Here we are with a virtual technology, with the technology that, uh, you know, is, that is, that is software focused and software based and, uh, and we can't travel and we can't go to the factories and we can't go to, uh, you know, the, the spot of action and see what's going on. And so we really had to adapt. We really had to make sure that we could start to make digital twin itself um, capable for that. You know, when we look at creating models, we have to be on site, we have to be there in person. So we had to create different types of auxiliary technologies really uh, to be able to help us uh, help us with that, with that challenge. And what we found was that creating these different types of technologies that supported the digital twin organization was very helpful because the technology itself that we were developing to support digital twin was also useful when, when it came to the to the execution and to the development of, of, of the systems. Um, so it was it was challenging to have a, uh, a technology that is supposed to be, uh, you know, uh, a fully digital uh, require physical, um, uh, you know, factors and physical variables. Um, but as we learned, you know, and as you mentioned, we've been doing this for so long, we were able to, to figure that out pretty quickly and see how we can make a make a valuable product for for our for our teams all right so um we're reaching the end of the the, the time right now so here so i really appreciate you um, joining us today i really appreciate all the all the sharing and um, there's things that's been great learning um and uh, yeah for for sure um, there will be probably more to come and i'm really excited to see what what else the um, digital twin will bring us in the future right so i think overall um, it does it did help us right to understand again the power of digital twin the technology and also how uh, advanced manufacturing right is actually increasing our competitiveness in the, in the market um so with that i want to finish the the meeting uh, thank you everybody for joining us today again um, please uh, do send us your questions. Uh, they will, you'll be getting a survey right after this uh, this meeting. And, and so please send us your questions. We'll be here to support you and to answer all the questions. And, and hopefully um, we hear from you soon. Okay, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Please join us for our next webinar. How can Industry 4.0 Technologies help you get to market faster on July 20th?